Insyaallah bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay. Alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ba'd. So we left off uh, at verse 116 of surah Ali Imran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim innal ladhina kafaru lan tughni anhum amwaluhum wala awladuhum minallahi shay'a. This translation is wrong. So ignore the translation. I'll give you my translation. Neither the wealth nor the children of the disbelievers will be of any benefit to them against Allah. So basically anything that people have of money, anything that people have of children, which they thought was like going to help them in their life, it's not going to benefit them in any way. They will be the residents of the hellfire. And they will live there forever. So Allah is basically critiquing the people that we saw in the last uh, few verses that we were talking about. مَثَلُ مَا يُنْفِقُونَ فِي هَذِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَثِلِ رِيحٍ فِيهَا سِرْقٌ أَصَابَتْ حَرْثَ قَوْمٍ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَأَهْلَكَتْ So, is this the right verse? Yeah. So the good, the, the things that people spend and do in this life, is like the harvest of a people who are evil and they're struck by a bitter wind. And that wind comes and destroys everything completely. So now I want you to imagine for a moment, imagine you're planting some plants. You put some seeds into the ground and you're watering your plants and all of a sudden they start growing. How long does it take? It takes a while, right? It takes effort. You have to have patience. And you're doing all of that and you're hoping some fruits are going to come out of these plants. And then what happens? All of a sudden, this massive wind comes and destroys every single thing that you've been trying to build. So people who are bad, people who are putting in all this effort and putting all this work but for the wrong things, all of that effort, all of the time that they're spending, it's not going to benefit them, them in any way. It's not going to help them at all. So Allah explains that. He says, وَمَا ظَلَمَهُمْ وَمَا ظَلَمَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَلَكِنْ أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ Allah did not wrong those people, but they wronged themselves. All right. The next verse, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَتَّخِذُوا بِطَانَةً مِّن دُونِكُمْ لَا يَأْلُونَكُمْ خَبَالًا وَدُّوا مَا عَنِدْتُمْ Again, ignore this translation. <laughs> I'm going to give you the translation. So it says, O you who believe, do not associate closely with other people who would not miss a chance to harm you. Basically, there are some people, all they want to do is they want to cause you problems as Muslims. They only want to harm you and they don't like you. And, you know, anytime their desire is to see you suffer, they want to see that you're always in trouble. Now, are there bad people like this who really hate Islam in the world today? Yes. There are some people, every little good thing that happens to a Muslim, they're upset. And any bad thing that happens, they get so happy. Like, look, got the Muslims again. So there are people like that, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, he's being warned about those people. He says that the prejudice that they have is evident from the things that they say, but what's in their heart is actually much worse than the things that they're doing. So there are some people in the world today, they hate Islam. They hate Muslims. And the bad things they say about Islam, you know what? In their hearts... They hate it even more compared to the bad things that they're saying with their mouths. So the translation of that is, uh, we have made our revelations clear for you, if only you could understand. So Allah is giving the example of an iceberg. Have you guys heard of this statement before? The tip of the iceberg? So the tip of the iceberg means there's a part of the iceberg that sticks out of the water, but underneath the water, it's way deeper. In fact, it's the same thing with the mountain. If you look at a mountain, you see a massive, huge mountain. Actually, that's the only part that you're seeing. The part that you're not seeing of the mountain is it goes deep down inside the earth, even deeper than it is sticking out. So Allah is saying that, you know what? The people who are trying to mess with, he's talking to the Prophet and the Muslims. The people that are harming you, 
people that are causing you problems, the people that are, you know, making your life difficult. You know what the reality is? The bad stuff that they say, it bothers you probably, right? But you know what? They actually hate you more than the things that they're saying. Actually, deep down, they have even more hatred for you. So the stuff that they're saying is only this. There's actually this much hatred that they have in their hearts against Allah, against the Messenger of Allah, against Islam. Now, why would Allah tell us this? Allah is telling you this so that, number one, you're careful and you're cautious about them. And number two, you have the right expectations about these people. You know, when you have the wrong expectations about somebody, you're going to get frustrated, right? You, you get annoyed, right? It's like, you know what? Imagine somebody has, every time you give them a task to do, they'll never do it properly. They always, they make, they make a mistake, they mess up, and like, there's always a problem happens. And then the next time, if your expectations are, I think this time, they're going to be able to do it correctly. And then if they mess up, you're like, again? This happened again? And you get so frustrated. But what if your expectation change and you say, you know what? This person has a very bad track record of executing things. They're just, this is just not there. Imagine, imagine somebody comes late every single time. And you're one of those people that gets annoyed when people are not on time. Anybody like that in this audience besides Cheryl Auntie? <laughs> it's just me and her then, you know? So Im imagine, yeah, this is a combo. We got a few people. So some people, for them, punctuality is not an important aspect of their life. Now imagine every single time you're waiting and you're hoping that they're going to come on time and then they show up late. You're like, why do they have to show up late? The next time you're hoping they're going to come on time, they show up late. If you expected them to somehow change, you're going to be let down every single time. If you alter your expectations and say, you know what? This person is probably going to come late because they just have a habit of coming late. How is that going to change your reaction towards when it happens? It's going to change it, right? It's going to be a very different mentality. So Allah is speaking about the enemies of Islam. And he's saying that, you know what? These people, they just have such a hatred in their hearts against you. Understand that and expect that so you don't keep getting frustrated and angry and surprised. I can't believe they're saying horrible things about Islam. There are some people, they have such a hatred of Islam. If you look at the state of Israel right now, the Zionists, was, if you look at their track record over 75 years, is what they're doing unexpected? No, it's in line with the behavior that everyone should have expected. Doesn't mean it's justified, doesn't mean that you don't care about it, but if you react to that as if, I can't believe this is happening. Well, why can't you believe it's happening? What were your expectations? Right? So we need to have the Allah's warning and saying, have the right expectations of people because He's telling us what's in their hearts. He's telling us the reality of things. So Allah is giving us basically a warning. And then He mentions the next verse. <laughs> Again, ignore the translation. He says, Here you are, you love them, but they don't love you. The Muslims, they were very nice and welcoming to everyone. And when people would speak nice words, they say, you know, we want to be nice. We want to be your friends. We want to do this. We want to do that. And Allah is saying, you're trying to be nice to them and you're trying to do this, but they don't love you at all. They don't care for you. And he says, but you believe in all the books. And when they meet you, they actually tell you, they say, oh, we believe. But when they go back alone, they bite their fingertips in rage at you. Now, this is an old way where somebody would bite their fingertip like this. And basically what it means, it's like giving the bad finger, the five fingers to somebody. Like that's, that's what it means. Okay. So this is what they do to you when they're alone. So they behave one way in front of you and they behave a completely different way when they leave. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, is being told, he's saying, tell them, may you die of your rage. This is a powerful statement. Because the Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's always nice, and he's friendly, and he's kind. But to people who are this bad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, sometimes you need to use tough words with people. So the response is, tell them that they're so mad, they hate Islam so much. He says, 
hopefully you die in your rage that you're going through right now because that's the type of person you are. Allah knows what is hidden in the hearts. So he's, he's reminding you that Allah knows what's in the hearts of people who really hate Islam. And they're constantly showing you animosity and hatred and all of that. They're saying, don't, you know, don't let this get to you. And then he says, In tamsaskum tasu'hum wa in yafrahu biha. When you are touched with some good, they will grieve. They'll be sad. Your enemies, the people who hate you, every time something good happens to you, they're going to be upset. But if you're hit with some harm, some calamity, they're going to be happy. But it's not normal. It doesn't mean someone has such a hatred of you. And then Allah says that, وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا لَا يَضُرُّكُمْ كَيْدُهُمْ شَيْئًا so I'll translate this for you. Uh, if you're patient and you're mindful of Allah, then all of their schemes and their plans and their plotting, it's not going to harm you at all. You don't need to worry. Allah is aware of what they're doing. So Allah is basically saying, yes, there are some people who hate Islam. Yes, there are some people who hate the Muslims very much. And you should know that. You should expect bad things from them, but don't let it bother you so much. Be patient. Allah has a plan for you. Everything is going to be fine. Now, I want you to compare what's being said right now with exactly the next incident that took place, which is the verses about the battle of Badr in 121. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this. So... Allah says, وَإِذْ غَدَوْتَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ تُبَوِّئُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ مَقَاعِدَ لِلْقِتَالِ Think about when you left your home in the early morning to position the believers in the battlefield. Okay, so now I'm going to read through the parentheses a little bit. So Allah is saying, think about this incident that happened when you, you is referring to the Prophet, peace be upon He was leading the army. Prophet's the military commander of the time. So when you left your home, so where did he leave his home for? He left to Mount Uhud, which was near Medina. If you go to Medina today, you visit Medina, you can still see Mount Uhud very close to Medina. They have like some of the nicest dates, Ajwa dates and stuff like that. I recommend visiting that area. So why did you go towards Mount Uhud? You went in the early morning to get the believers in their positions for battle. So now there's a lot to talk about here. Okay, First of all, <clears throat> Uhud was a very important battle that took place. Uh, golden Toyota Highlander is blocking a car, needs to be moved. SUV, Toyota Highlander. If not here, then try the cafe, inshallah. No problem. So um, this is known as the Battle of Uhud. So if you look at the verse, see the parentheses? The parentheses is the commentary. Do you see the word Uhud anywhere in the verse here? You see it? Shayda, do you see it? The word Uhud outside of parentheses? Not outside of parentheses. Which means that it's not directly mentioned in the Quran what it's referring to. The only way to know this is by understanding the Quran through history of what happened. Through the correct context. Now imagine if I removed the parentheses. I added the parentheses here. Imagine if we removed all the parentheses. What would you get? The verse would be, when you left your home in the early morning to position the believers in the battlefield. What does that mean? Where? When? How? You wouldn't be able to get it, right? So there had to be an understanding that there is a context and there is a history that we need to know in order to understand the Quran correctly. In its proper way. And that's one of the reasons why we study the subject called tafsir. Tafsir means explanation of the Quran. Explanation of the Quran doesn't just mean, well, I'm reading the Quran, the words, and I'm going to tell you what I think about it. You need to know what the history is. You need to know what actually happened there. And that is documented in, in books of history. So we need to know that. So that's why I added the word Uhud in there. So they're going towards Uhud. Now we need to understand, okay, what is Uhud? Well, Uhud, number one, if I just say Uhud, Uhud is a mountain next to Medina. So why is the Prophet going to the mountain? Because there is a battle 
that's going to be taking place. And this battle happened in the year 3 AH. Can anyone tell me what AH means? Anybody else? Yes. After Hijrah. Okay. And what is Hijrah? Who can tell me what Hijrah means? Yes. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, migrated with the Muslims from Mecca to Medina. So 3 AH is the year in the Islamic calendar when events took place, meaning three years after the migration to Medina. That's when the Islamic calendar starts. So the Battle of Uhud, this battle right here, it took place in 3 AH. One year earlier, 12 months before, there was another battle that took place. Does anyone know what that battle was called? You can't shout it out. Somebody else. I say, I say you can't shout it out. <laughs> you can't shout. Yes. Badr, the Battle of Badr. Okay. So there were two very important early battles that happened when the Prophet migrated to Medina. One was the Battle of Badr, which happened first. The second was the Battle of Uhud. This verse is talking about the Battle of Uhud. Okay. And we've seen a little bit about the Battle of Badr. So the Battle of Uhud was a very important battle. So was the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr was a very important battle. Here, the Battle of Uhud, there were 3,000 soldiers from the tribe of Quraysh, which are the idol worshippers, which is the Prophet's tribe, but they refused to accept Islam. So they came from Mecca, and they're marching to go and attack the city of Medina. 700 of them are wearing chain mail. Can anyone tell me what chain mail is? Yes, it's a type of armor that's made by links, like metal links. You can move around a little bit and you can fight. So 700 of them were wearing chain mail, which was like advanced technology at the time. 200 of them are cavalry, meaning they have horses. They're ready to fight. And the reason why they're going and attacking the Muslim, does anybody know? Why is there an army that sets out from Mecca with 3,000 soldiers, 200 horses, 700 of them wearing chain mail to go and attack the Muslims in Medina? Why are they doing that? You got a lot of brothers. Love to see more sisters. And even though you're in the sister section, technically, you still count as a brother. So you're, that does not help the not the help of the section. <laughs> so, anybody? Okay, go ahead. Ah, you're thinking about the Battle of Badr. Good, 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 good. You remember that? But that was about the Battle of Badr. Why are they going to attack Medina in the year three after Hijra, Hijra near Uhud? Yes. It's, they hate each other. I mean, they hate the Muslims. That's true. But there's one more very important thing. Anyone? Yes. Revenge of Badr. Exactly. So they want to have revenge because the Muslims won the Battle of Badr a year ago. So now they say, we're going to come back and we're going to round two of this battle. We're going to fight you. So they're coming and they want revenge. So what does the Prophet, peace be upon him, do? He was a leader. He was a leader of the Muslims. He was a military commander. So what he does is what's called shura. Shura means consultation. He went to the Muslims in Medina and he asked them for their opinion. And he's the prophet, right? He doesn't need to ask for anybody's opinion. He's re I'm receiving revelation from Allah. I, could, I don't need to consult with you guys. But he wanted to set an example for everyone. So you know what? Even when making very important decisions, you should consult with people. And he's the role model. So if he just made decisions without consulting, what would happen later on? People would be like, yeah, what would happen later on? They would do the decision by themselves. And if he consulted... Then they'd be like, you know what? If the Prophet consulted, what about us? We don't receive revelation from Allah. We got to consult, right? So he consulted the people and he wanted also to win their hearts. He wanted to make sure that they're really dedicated to him. So he consulted the Muslims and they had two options. Option number one, stay inside Medina. Let them attack the city. We'll defend Medina from the inside. Option number two, we go outside the city of Medina and the route that they're taking, we're going to basically meet them outside in the battlefield like they did in the Battle of Badr, and we'll fight in an open field. It's going to be more of a battle, more of a fight. Now, if you were there, you were there, which one would you have chosen and why? Would you choose to stay inside the city of Medina or go outside the city of Medina? Yes, Isa. Which one? Option one, stay in Medina. All right, explain to me why would you do that? That's true. Good point. So someone, if you go out of Medina, someone can get in, sneak into Medina, and then they could like destroy the city. That's one point. And number two, Medina has fortifications. It has walls. So you're way more defended. You're way more protected. So I'm with Isa. I would have done the same thing. I would have been like, you know what? Let's defend from inside the city of Medina.
But many of the Muslims, they started saying, no, we want to go out there. We want to fight them. We're not going to stay here and just defend in Medina. We want to go out and fight. Them. What was the reason why they decided to go out and fight them? You guys know? Ali, you know? You must have just taken a class on this. Go ahead. Oh, you don't? Okay, well, tell me. Uh, okay, okay. So if anything happens to the people who are not fighting in the city, then maybe there's more danger inside. Okay, that's a good guess. Uh, yes, on the floor. Okay, so they won't be able to beat them completely or something like that? Yes. So anything in the city won't get destroyed. Okay, these are all good theories. You have another one? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's good. So that's so that's one of the two reasons. There's two reasons. And in the back. Prove them wrong that anybody could beat you in the out, outside as well. Okay, okay. So that was part of it too. So so there were there were two main reasons. Number one is that, you know, they're like, we're courageous. We can fight. We won the battle of brother. We can do this. Let's go outside. Let's fight. We can do this. Number two, there were several people, several Muslims who did not fight in the battle of brother because the battle of brother wasn't supposed to happen. It, it, they did not know it was going to be a battle. They actually went out for a different reason and they ended up getting stuck. So a lot of people got left behind in Medina and they couldn't be part of the Battle of Brother. They wouldn't have caught up in time. So those people said, hey, we got left out in the first battle. We want to be part of the second battle. We, we want to be out in the open too. And you know the Arabs were known to be generally very courageous people. So they're trying to show their courage. Like, we can do this. You know, we got these guys. Come on, we can do it. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard, when he saw those people, and he saw two groups of people, what did he do? He put on his armor. He had, he had chain mail as well. He put on his armor and he set out in the early morning to go to Uhud and said, we are not staying in the city. We are going to go out. Afterwards, this is kind of some details, but let me see. Should I share these details? No, we're almost out of time. So I won't share these details. But so what happened was they went out to Uhud. How many... How many Quraysh soldiers are on their way? How many? 3,000. Heavily armed. They have weapons. They have sold, They have uh, armor. They have horses. They have everything. How many Muslims are there ready to fight and go into battle? 1,000. So you have 1,000 Muslim soldiers going to be going against 3,000 Quraysh, you know, idolater soldiers. Now, only 100 of them, of the Muslims, have chain mail. Right, they're way less equipped. Right, one hundred versus seven hundred in terms of the armor that they have. When they left, when they went out, there was a group led by a man because they're small little groups of Muslims. They all come together. There was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He was the head of the hypocrites. He's a guy who's pretending to be Muslim, but he's not actually a Muslim. When they went out, he made an excuse and said, "You know what?" I told you, my opinion was we should have stayed in the Medina and we should have defended the city. So when right here, this verse is talking about when the Prophet went out and he was aligning the soldiers on the way to Uhud, which is not far at all. Abdullah ibn Ubay had 300 soldiers with him. He said, you know what? If this Prophet is not going to listen to my advice, he, he was about to be the king of Medina before the Prophet came. So he has some jealousy in his heart. He said, if he's not going to listen to me, I'm leaving. I'm not going to risk my life for this. So 300 soldiers went back and led by the head of the hypocrites in Medina, Abdullah ibn Ubay. How many Muslim soldiers are left? 700. Against how many? 3,000. This is going to be the battle of Uhud that's taking place. So what does the Prophet, peace be upon him, do? Allah is mentioning, he says, you set out in the morning to position the believers in the battlefield why do they need to be positioned? They are more than four times outnumbered by the enemy. 700 Muslims versus 3,000. That means that you need to have the Muslims in exact perfect positions to have a military strategy to be able to win this war. So I'll conclude with this since it's, it's 8 o'clock already. The importance of being organized was understood by the Prophet, peace be upon him. Look what he's saying. He's saying you are preparing and get the believers in their positions ready. If Muslims have the mentality, you know, he's the prophet of Allah, he's the messenger of Allah. Receiving, what did Allah just say in the previous verses? These people are planning against you, have patience, they're not going to be able to harm you at all. Just, we, just in the previous verse. Don't worry, Allah will take care of it, it's going to happen. Does that mean the Muslim can be like, oh, good, 
let's relax, man. We don't need to really organize ourselves. Let's just go out to Uhud and we're going to get some, you know, we're going to get some chai, get some chai and some dates. We're going to sit down. Allah's going to take care of the rest. We're going to win this battle. That's not the attitude of a believer. That's not the attitude of the Prophet. This is the messenger of Allah. Peace and blessings be upon him. Receiving direct revelation and Allah has promised him that he is not going to be a failure as a prophet. He is going to be victorious in his lifetime. So he knows this promise from Allah. Does he go and say, hey guys, let's, just, let's chill out. Let's just relax. Allah's, Allah's going to take care of everything. No. He's going and he's positioning himself and he's making sure that everything is properly organized. So the, the important lesson here is that it's not enough to say, you know what, I'm Muslim. Muslims are supposed to be victorious. Let's just trust in Allah. That everything's going to work out. It's going to be fine. Allah will take care of it. We don't have to do our part. Then it's not enough to just simply be courageous and say, you know what, we're, we won the battle of Badr. We can do this. We got this. It's not going to be a problem. No, you need to be organized. The messenger of Allah, peace and blessing be upon him, he understood that. And he displayed that. So the lesson for everybody is, you know what, in every aspect of your life, there is a level of seriousness. There's a level of organization that you need in order for you to be successful. Some things are a little bit less. Like, for example, your room. If your room is not organized, what happens? What's the problem with your room being messy and dirty and not organized? And your bed is not made and there's toys all over the place and there's books everywhere. What's, what's the problem with that? You can't find stuff. Yeah, It's like all over. When you need something, you won't be able to find it. And it'll also like overwhelm you when you look at all these things, right? But what's the worst thing that's going to happen? It's going to be hard to find something. No one's going to die, but it's still not good. So you should be organized, right? When we come into the masjid, the Prophet taught us organization. Straighten the rows of prayer. You see how the rows are straight? Perfectly straight. It's very important to straighten the rows. In fact, so much that the imam, before the imam starts, they learned this from the Prophet, is that he used to say, make sure your lines are straight. And he would turn around and he would look to make sure the rows are straight. And he would check. And if somebody's somebody's moving forward or whatever, he'd say, hey, you got to back up. This line needs to be straight. So the importance of straight lines is very important because it's connected to the way in which you live your life. And when it comes on the battlefield, it's way more risky, right? So you need to make sure that your army is organized in a straight line, in a proper line. You can't be like, hey, guys, you know what? We're about to fight 3,000 soldiers and they got all the armor and everything. But hey, make a line. And they're sitting there all haphazard. Like we need to defend. Imagine what would happen if your line is not straight in a battlefield. Imagine if you tell someone, you people need to be in this section, you need to be over this section. And then someone's like, you know what? I think I'm just going to go on that section. I'm not really needed over here. It's going to be, it's going to be extremely dangerous. People are going to die, right? So there are some things which are more, is this, mission critical they're more they're more important that you need to be organized in terms of your room okay it should be in terms of the prayer lines it should be the risk is not as high but when it comes to battle when it comes to if you're doing some science experiment and they're like you know if you mix too much of this chemical with this chemical it will explode in your face right do you need to be careful you need to be extremely careful right they're like don't mix these two chemicals together can have a really big problem. So there are some times where the risk is very, very high. Sometimes where the risk is lower, but what happens is that when you live your life a certain way where you're undisciplined and you have the inability to be disciplined even when you need it, then that's going to carry over to the times when you need it, you still can't do it. So we need to be very careful about this and we'll finish because time is over. We'll finish the rest of the, uh, the, the, the surah later or the, the, the verse later, but there's one very important lesson. I'm just going to give you the, the summary. The Muslims lost the battle of Uhud. Many Muslims died in the battle of Uhud. Why did they lose? Allah is going to explain why they lost. They lost because of the internal weakness of the Muslims. Because Muslims did not do what they were supposed to do. And it's all directly connected with being organized, being in line, doing your part in the battle, and there were a group of Muslims who did not do their part properly that they were supposed to do, and that's why the Muslims lost the battle. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us understand these things. Any questions from today's lesson? Up there? Okay, go ahead. Yes, inshallah. We will do that. We will do that.
right at the end of the Q and A session. Inshallah. Okay, we will. Inshallah. Are there any other questions? The war started in the year three AH, and it lasted a uh, a day. Other questions? Any other questions? Okay, inshallah. So we'll conclude here. We're going to conclude with the dua. Inshallah, the sister is requesting. We do make dua uh, every morning at Fajr prayer. So anyone who comes to our Fajr, we make dua for the people of Gaza. But we'll conclude with the dua as well for them, inshallah, ta'ala, especially for her family, inshallah. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. Tabarak rabbana ya zal jalal wa ikram. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina azab al nar. Oh Allah. Help our brothers and sisters who are weak in Gaza and in Palestine. O Allah, protect them and save them. O Allah, accept those people who have passed away, those people who have died and been killed and been martyred. O Allah, accept them as your martyrs and enter them directly into paradise. O Allah, stop the tyranny and depression that the state of Israel is perpetrating on the Palestinian people. O Allah, help those people who, who are in positions of authority and positions of power. O Allah, help them to agree and sign and pressure for a ceasefire so that the people stop dying. O oh Allah, help us Muslims to learn the lessons we're supposed to learn from these incidents. O oh Allah, help us to organize ourselves so that we can have the power and the tawfiq and success from you to be able to stop this type of injustice from taking place. O oh Allah, help our brothers and sisters who are suffering in all parts of the world. I mean, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu.